Louis Patron back with the Key West Lou Legal Hour, and thank you again for joining me this morning. I'm talking about money. I started with Cyprus, Germany, and the Euro Bank. There is a lot of money being made in this country, there, worldwide, in fact, and it's being made by bankers. Bankers, you understand? The people who won't loan money out anymore, uh, those that contributed 99% to the mortgage situation that happened in 2008 in this country that brought us into this great recession. But the heads of these banks and these investment houses, financial houses, they're all banks. They're making tons of money. Some people are making 20, 30, 40 million dollars a year in either salary or year-end bonuses. Unheard of money. Let me give you an example of a banker, a financial person, who is living big off of our economy, has made a ton of money on the mortgage foreclosures because it's a hedge fund. And hedge funds bet against where they, people normally think the market's going. They bet against the success of the mortgage industry, banking industry, and they made a ton of money. It's a gambling game, so to speak. His name is Stephen Cohen. And all I'm going to do is share with you what has happened to Stephen Cohn in the past week. Just one week in the life of Stephen Cohn. He is the CEO of SAC Capital Advisors, one of the largest hedge funds in the world. He's an American. This past week, he bought a home in the Hamptons. That's that beautiful ultra-rich section, ultra-rich section of Long Island. In the Hamptons for $60 million. God bless him. $60 million. Now, what makes it funny is he's got another house right next door that he already owned that cost $115 million. I think he bought the second house as a guest house for his friends. $60 million. Also this week, Stephen Cohn bought a Picasso. He paid for, this is personally he bought the Picasso. He bought a Picasso. He paid for the Picasso $155 million. A lot of money. You got a, two commitments by this guy in one week. $60 million, $155 million. That's not the end of it. He didn't spend any more money, but in reality he's going to because he's going to be fined. He's under investigation by the SEC and everyone else for what we call insider trading. People who trade are not supposed to know, invest because they have knowledge about what's going to happen. It's a crime. And it's a civil proceeding, subject to approval, though, by a federal judge. And the government has brought this proceeding against him, charging him with violations of the law for insider training, trading. He is one of the claims against him. He is, has agreed to settle. Not all of them, but one he has agreed to settle this week for $616 million. You heard me. First the 60 for the house, then the 155 for the Picasso. Now he's going to spend $616 million to pay money that's owed or fines and penalties to the government. And that money, the articles say, is, are coming, that $616 million is coming out of Steve Cohen's pocket. He's going to pay it personally because he's going to pay it through a corporation he owns, but he owns the whole corporation, 100% of the stock, some little corporation. So all I'm trying to do is show you that while people are still struggling in this country, forget the rest of the world. We've got to be selfish for a moment. While people are still suffering in our country, there are people in our country eating big. 60 million, 115 million, 55 million, and $616 million committed in one week. That's a lot of money, and it's wrong. It's the rich getting richer while the poor stay poor. Now, I want to give you another example of how things have been working. Uh, the rich get richer and the poor get poor. There is a fellow by the name of David K. Johnson. David K. Johnston. He's a Pulitzer Prize winner. He's an economist. Uh, he, he had an article this week in Huffington Post. And it was a very good article. And he talked about the disparity between the rich and the poor in this country. And he did it very well. He says that in the last 50 years, from the year 1966 to 2011, 1966, 2011, which really 47 years, okay? In the last 47 years, he compared the income of the poor and the income of the rich, took inflation into account, 
because your buying power is affected by inflation. In the bottom 90% of our society, the bottom 90% of wage earners, so to speak, in the last 47 years, from 1966 to 2011, your buying power went up $59. That's all, $59. But in the top 10% of those making money in this country, the earnings went up $116,000, adjusted after inflation. Bottom 90% only went up in, in effect 50 years, $59. The top 10% in this country, they expanded the top 2%. $116,000. Doing it another way, to show how it works, he explained it this way. If the 90% who only went up $56 is one inch, the top 10% who went up $116,000 is equivalent to 68 feet. One inch to 68 feet. And so it goes. All right. Now we're going to stay with the economy yet a little bit. There is a town called Windsor, Missouri, and the mayor called together his department heads last week, and he says, hey, things are tight, we don't have enough money, we don't have enough cash flow, you've all got to go out and cut your budgets, save money wherever you can. They have a Department of Public Works. The, the head of the Department of Public Works is a woman, a female, and she brought her people together, and this is one of the ideas she came up with for, I'm laughing already, for saving money. She told her male employees that they would have, from this point forward, to bring their own toilet paper to work. It would not be provided. However, this did not affect the women who were working in the Department of Public Works. The city would still provide the toilet paper. Can you imagine having to bring your own toilet paper to work? Anyhow, the mayor heard about this, had another meeting, went crazy. It wasn't intended to be this severe. And so now everyone's getting toilet paper again. That's the way it goes, though. We're going to go now to the Supreme Court. This past week had two days of hearings on gay marriage, same-sex marriage, whether it's constitutional or not. We all know what went on there. I'm not going to bore you with that again. But this, these were historic arguments, uh, no question about it. An historical moment in the history of this country, in the history of the Supreme Court and their decision making. Now, the Supreme Court has very few seats. It has limited seats. It has about 500 seats for, for people who want to go and watch the proceedings. But 200 of those or 300 are taken up by personnel, Supreme Court, people who have already got, uh, been admitted. There's only about 100 to 200 seats available for the public to walk in. Well, and they have tickets. They give you a ticket for this to go in. Everyone wanted to see this show, for want of a better term. And the only way you could get a ticket, it was first come, first serve, was to stand in line. Now, the first argument was Tuesday. The second argument was Wednesday. In order to get a ticket for Tuesday or Wednesday, you had to stand in line from Thursday. You had to get in line Thursday and stay there overnight, 24 hours a day, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, blah, blah, blah. And you work out your own details how you're going to live. How many people can afford the time to do this? How many people want to do this? I think they can afford. How many that would want to be there? But how many would do it? It's a gross inconvenience. Well, there are companies, as it turns out, in Washington, D.C., that will stand in line for you, okay, and buy a ticket. They will stand in line for $36 an hour. Most get $50 an hour. If you compute the time, there was a major article on this. Oh, my God. If you compute the time it takes from Thursday to Tuesday, it comes out to $6,000 at $50 an hour. What I am telling you is that many people, over 100, paid $6,000 to get a ticket to sit down and watch the oral arguments on gay marriage. Oh my God. We should televise the Supreme Court proceedings, then we could all watch it for free. All right, we are going now to break in a few seconds. When you return, or when I return, I'm going to talk about what goes around, comes around. I'm going to talk about the Catholic Church. I'm going to talk about birth control, contraception. 
I, I'm going to talk about Obamacare, and I'm going to talk about Boston College, a Jesuit institution where something is brewing and is going to explode this week, in my opinion. So please stay with me, folks. I'll return after the station break.